Hi, Brent. First of all, let me apologize that I'm sitting outside looking like this, but I just got back from my morning exercise and I usually sit down in the backyard and I thought I would do the same. And rather than write an answer, uh, I would just record it on a video. And uh, normally, I, I want to say from the outset, normally I don't actually respond to questions like that because a lot of times try, people try to peg you or they try to label you. They try to determine where you fit in within their, what I call, continuum of knowledge of good and evil, where I fit in on that scale or that ladder of good versus evil and where I fit in on the doctrinal uh, uh, continuum. But I know you and I've known you for many years and so for that particular reason I, I, I know your heart and, and I wanted to answer for that for that reason. So first of all let me point out that in the Bible and I and, and I, I want to use both Bible here, but also personal experience. Uh, because I, you know, there's um, conceptual truth and there is empirical truth. And of course, conceptual truth is something that has been passed down. It is, and you understand this, uh, something that passed down. It's a worldview, it's a belief, it's, uh, it's dogma. And, uh, and that's valid. We all have been handed a, a set of beliefs. But then there is empirical truth, which is something that, that deals with observation and experience. In other words, you've experienced something that then shaped your, how you see the world. And so I would suggest that uh, my view has, in many ways, been shaped by empirical truth, that which I've observed, that which I have experienced. In regards to, so let me just start with the Bible. It says in um, Ephesians chapter 4, the God, the Father, is above all, through all, and in all. Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God is within you. You look for the kingdom of God over there or there. Not to suggest it's not there, but the kingdom of God is within you. That was the central theme of Jesus' message. In fact, um, if you go back to the days that Jesus lived, everybody talked about the kingdom of God. It was a common theme among all the rabbis. So what made Jesus unique and what angered the religious leaders is because rather than interpret this through a political lens, which they did, that the kingdom of God would come and free them from the oppression of the Romans, Jesus interpreted this Oh, Jesus spoke of this as the kingdom of God is something that is within you. And then later on, we learned the kingdom of God is, um, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the spirit. And so we see this, and we see, of course, that also demonstrated through Jesus in everything that Jesus said. Love your neighbor. Uh, do good to those that hate you. Pray for those that spitefully use you. And, and so Jesus demonstrated this kind of... Um, that the father was, you know, he said in one place, the father, I'm in the father, the father is in me, I'm in you, you are in me. Which kind of uh, suggests that God is in everything. In fact, Paul quotes the Epicureans when he says, um, in God we live and move and have our being. So this idea that many times we have based our thoughts or our beliefs on that God is somewhere in heaven, this other location is really not um, in many ways contradicts what Jesus and Paul spoke about in the Bible. And so that's the beginning. And then I think about the fact that it says in Genesis chapter 2 that God breathed into the nostrils of man and man became a living being. And the word here uh, became a living being is a soul. Now you could you could you could call spirit that there is one spirit. It's God's spirit that permeates the universe. That the very essence of God permeates the universe, which physicists many of them agree with. In other words, when I say spirit, I refer to consciousness, and when I refer to God, I speak of um, God is 
the formless consciousness. Consciousness, as you know, is uh, what makes us alive today. Um, you can have thoughts, like a computer has thoughts, but it's not conscious. And consciousness is what separates us, what uh, all of life is to some extent is conscious to various degrees. I, I, I certainly believe that, and I believe that consciousness is, is God, God's spirit. Now, so when it comes to Christ, the word, as you know, is a Greek word that that stems from a Hebrew word, which is Messiah, and which means anointed or anointed one. And that to me simply means dimension of God, a dimension of God um, that permeates all things. And so we then come to um, Colossians chapter 3, where it says that he starts the argument in Colossians chapter 1 with set your mind on things above, set your heart on things above. And as you do, and then he goes on a few verses later on here, there is neither Greek nor Jew, and I'm sure exactly those are the terms that used, but he goes through a list of different people, and some of them were considered quite... Um, I, I mean, some of them were not exactly the most liked people on earth. And he went through all these different people and he said, Christ is all and in all. In other words, he, he was saying that once you come to a certain level of seeing, when you set your mind think on things above, when you, when you come to that place of seeing, you will see that uh, Christ is all and in all. Now, I, I used the example in my DM to you that is it true that the, the sun rises and the sun sets? Of course it is, from my perspective. But there is a higher truth that if you would actually rise above the earth, you would see that there is no such a thing as the earth uh, or that, that the sun sets and sun rises. It's only our perception. And so what I'm saying to you is, is there are a perception that Paul talks about that when you set your mind on things above, when you come to that place, what you begin to see is Christ is all and in all. In other words, a dimension of God is within all people. Now you brought up, and I think you did this very skillfully in your message to me today that you're praying for me, and, and you quoted Ephesians chapter 3, where it says that, that Paul's prayer is that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That is, that you being rooted and grounded in love may receive all the fullness of God. I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, but, but you know what I'm talking about. And so it says that the Christ may dwell in your hearts. Now, first of all, let's point this out. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to believers. And he, for some reason, is suggesting or implying that Christ is not dwelling in the hearts because he's praying that they that Christ may dwell in the hearts. You say, well, if Christ is all and in all, how could Christ not be dwelling in the hearts of even Christians? Well, we have to understand what are we at the very core? We are spirit, but we also have a heart. We have a cognitive mind, we have a heart. And, and if you go back to Solomon, he says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, your identity who you believe yourself to be is rooted in your heart. And then he says, um, uh, out of the, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. And the word issues of life here actually speaks of geographical borders. The limitations of your life, in other words, are determined by your heart. In other words, you know, we have the word subconscious that we understand today. In other words, I think for heart is subconscious that since childhood we've been programmed to see ourselves a certain way that then guides and directs how we live. So when Paul is talking about that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, he is suggesting that, and then he goes on to explain as that is that you're being rooted and grounded in love. 
that that our sense of identity would be transformed to the point where we now the heart your spirit your true essence your spirit the dimension with god is in union with god but we're not aware of it we're not awake to it but when your heart um, when our heart is awakened then we begin to identify as Christ and to identify with Christ is to be an expression of love and an expression of love is always giving is always extending love uh, is never wanting and love does not fear in other words love does not seek anything from anything love does not fear anything and so what I'm suggesting to you is that and I, I, I can go into this a lot more and I wrote about it in my latest book and I'm not like my book and I also talked about it on my on my latest podcast 14 series or 14 episode series I don't care whether you watch it but I or, or whether you buy it that and I say this sincerely it doesn't make any difference to me but what I want but but I'm suggesting that if you're really interested in learning more then there are different ways of seeing this uh, and I would never thought that 15 years ago I would have this conversation I would see it this way but I didn't come to see it this way because I was mad at the church or because I was mad at uh, Christians or, or any of that it was just by experience I don't know whether that means anything but at least I think you have a better understanding of what I think. So yes, um, I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Brent. I hope we can um, talk soon.